uh, record, which I guess is useful. And I can see the transcription in the window. Okay, um, and I am reminded to let you all know that this is being recorded. Um, you know, um, so if you want to jump in and participate, just be aware that that it will be on the recorded thing. Feel free at any stage to shout out, redirect me, tell me to do something different, uh, and I'll be very uh, happy to do that and kind of to take advice on what you want to learn in this session. The other thing I wanted to try and do is to make a note of who's here. Sure. Whether that's immediately possible or not. Okay, we'll try that later on. Um, I guess what I can do. Nothing else. I can screenshot a list of all of your names. So that's done. OK, uh, what I'm going to do now. Is share my screen. Some students are unable to join because the computers are not allowing them to join on teams. Ah, that's a bit frustrating for them, I'm sure. Um, it it should be something. Um, that they can maybe join on uh, on phones if necessary as well. Obviously, we're recording it, so I'll make sure the recording's available. Um, but yeah, tell them no problem if they if they want to join late because eventually it works or something like that. That's absolutely fine. And thanks for letting me know. OK. Uh, OK, great. Thanks, Benaya. That's that's really useful uh, to hear. Appreciate it. I guess let me just check. Can everyone now see uh, my um, screen, which has got on the left hand side a camera that looks like that, and on the right hand side the uh, exam paper? Thank you. Uh, I see a thumbs up, which is what I wanted to see. Um, so this is the exam paper that we're going to go through. Uh, Naveed tells me he's already covered question one. Um, and my plan is to go through question two, question three. Uh, you might have already covered three part two, but I wouldn't mind going through that again because those questions are really like they're good exam questions. If you're ready for them, you can you can just clean up on them. So I, I want to make sure everyone's ready for questions like that. And then if we've got time, we'll do question four part two as well. Um, and uh, that's roughly the plan for today. I, I'm going to bring up the question sheet from time to time, but mostly I'll maximize the, the video bit of it so that people can see. And I'm sorry, it's a slightly, uh, it's not as um, brilliant a camera as I'm hoping for, um, but I hope you'll be able to see what's going on and I'll explain it as I'm going as well. So. Uh, any questions before we get started? Good. I'll Thumbs try and me. work. Oh, thanks, Joe. Okay, good. Uh, I'll try and work through these roughly as if I was, um, you know, approaching them for the first time in an exam. Uh, I think that's a that's kind of a key thing. So um, I'll I'll give you the tips on what I would think if I saw this in an exam. Um, and with that, I'm going to full screen here. Um, this is the exam paper on paper, and this is the question we're doing. So you open up the exam paper. And. It's a bit better. OK, so that's doing some kind of nicer autofocus. Um, and um, you see this question about an axial force applied to some assembly. So the very first thing that I would do straight away, this is question two, part one. Draw out the diagram. Uh, I know those of you who I've taught in other classes will have heard me say this a lot, but it, it really does help to kind of get things clearish in your own mind. So we've got some kind of a um, 
a square section um, assembly, they're calling it, and it's got an outside made of brass and an inside made of steel. Uh, and we're given Young's modulus. Again, I'm just kind of taking information off the exam paper here. Young's modulus for the brass is 105 gigapascals. Young's modulus for the steel is 200 gigapascals. Um, and there's some dimensions on the paper as well. If I just draw a second diagram over here, never be afraid to draw multiple diagrams if you have to. Those dimensions are, that's 20 millimetres there. And these ones here are five millimetres. Which means the whole thing is 30 millimetres. And everything's square. Um, so that, you know, the same thing is true along the bottom as as up the side there where I've just drawn it. And then the last thing we get from the question is that this height is 250 millimetres. So all I've done so far is to uh, write down what's given to me in the question. I like to think I'll probably uh, get some marks in the exam just for, for doing that. But also it's helped me to, to start understanding what's going on. Um, one thing that I might do right away is convert uh, all lengths to meters. Um, and that just helps a little bit because in some of these solid mechanics questions, not in this one admittedly, but in others, you end up like taking things to the power of four or the power of three and millimeters to the power of four is a kind of confusing unit. So I like to just get everything in meters to start off with. 250 millimeters is 0.25 meters. You want to be good at these kinds of conversions. Uh, five millimeters equals 0.005 meters. 20 millimeters equals 0.02 meters. And 30 millimeters equals 0.03 meters. And in each of those cases, what I've done is to divide by 1000. So 250 divided by 1000 is 0 0.25, and that's the conversion from millimeters to meters. Um, <clears throat> OK, now we need to go back and look at the question again and see what we were actually asked to do. And the question says a force of. 60 kilonewtons is applied in compression. Uh, it doesn't actually say it's applied in compression, but I guess that's what it means. Um, I'm going to write in compression. You could evaluate the whole thing in tension and you get exactly the same answer, but it's just useful to me to think of this, this entire apparatus being squashed or compressed somehow. Um, so that's that's what I'm doing. Um, and then now we need to start solving the problem. And what what's happening in the kind of big picture is the brass and the steel are both being compressed. And the first thing that we we can note is they're. They're part of the same structure. So however much you squash the brass lengthwise, you know, if I compress this so that it's this high, let's say, um, so that it's shrunk from being that length to being that length, then the brass and the steel have both shrunk the same amount. And whatever I do in terms of compression or tension, I'm going to stretch or compress the brass and the steel the same amount. So that um, is something I can use. Brass and steel have to deform the same amount. which means epsilon, the strain in the brass, equals epsilon, the strain in the steel. Um, and I'll just call that epsilon, right? I don't need to define whether it's in the brass or the steel because they're the same thing. Um, then I'm just moving some stuff out of the way so I can move this. Um, 
so I can write on a new bit. The other thing that we'll need, so this one here, I think they call this the compatibility condition sometimes. Um, don't worry too much about the name. You don't need the name. You just need the understanding that the brass and the steel have to deform the same amount. But it can be useful just to think, if you see a question like this, what do I need? I need the compatibility condition where everything deforms the same amount. And then um, you've also got another set of conditions, which is about force. Um, so I'll say force and equilibrium. I can spell equilibrium, which I can't always do. Um, again, it's not a spelling test, so don't worry about that kind of thing. Um, the 60 kilonewtons has to be supported by the force in the steel plus the force in the brass, right? Those are the only two things which can um, contribute into that, um, that force. And now we've got something to do with force. We've got something to do with um, uh, strain. It may be just worth remembering at this stage. Think about the, the data sheet. And I guess one thing that's really kind of useful here um, well, the title of the question says mechanical and thermal loading. I was going to say it, you can link the title of the question um, sort of working out where you need to look in your uh, data sheet. In this case, that's not quite true because the data sheet is called normal stress and strain. But anything where you've got this alpha here is the um, thermal expansion coefficient if we need that, and these are temperatures. Anything where you've got uh, thermal expansion or stress and strain, you want this set of um, uh, information, this set of, of things from the data sheet. So I'm just going to go and write those down right away. I might pick a different colour just uh, so I uh, remember that these are generally useful. Stress is force over area. Strain is change in length divided by original length, and stress is also Young's modulus times strain. Um, so this is pretty good because what we've got, we've got something to do with force. Um, here, force can link to stress, and stress can link to strain. And we know already, I guess when you're doing these questions, it's helpful to think about what you already know. We know the areas involved. I'm gonna go actually back up here and calculate some areas just so I can have those ready to go. Uh, the area of the steel, is the it's a square so it's the base times the height or the side squared which is 0 0.02 squared and i'll put that in my calculator four times ten to the minus four square meters and the area of the brass this is a bit trickier. The area of the whole square is 30 millimetres squared or 0.03 metres squared, but the brass has this bit cut out of the middle for the steel. So this is 0.03 squared minus 0.02 squared. The outer area minus the shaded area. And that is five times 10 to the minus four square meters. Um, and this is a useful reminder again about a bit of exam strategy. If you're not quite sure how to progress, calculate some geometry, calculate some areas. Um, those kinds of things are often useful further down the line, and they might just make you think, ah, OK, I can use this area 
in this formula about stress and strain, for example. So let's go back to where we were. We had our force condition, and this we're going to try and work through now to something that we can solve um, for a single unknown. So the force in the steel, if sigma equals F over A, that means F equals sigma A, rearranging that equation, multiplying both sides by A. So we've got stress in the steel multiplied by area of the steel, plus stress in the brass multiplied by area of the brass. So I've just replaced force with stress times area for both of those materials. Um, then I know stress is Young's modulus times the strain. So Young's modulus for the steel times the strain. It's the strain for the steel, but we've already agreed up here that that's the same as the strain in the brass. So Young's modulus for the steel times the strain overall times the area of the steel plus Young's modulus for the brass times the strain times the area of the brass. And I can take out a factor now of this strain and leave everything else in brackets. OK, this is starting to look pretty promising because we know the left hand side of the equation is 60,000. We know all of these things, the Young's modulus and the area for each of the um, uh, steel and the brass. So we can substitute in some numbers now. 60,000, same on the left hand side, is the strain multiplied by Young's modulus of the steel. That was in the question, and we wrote it down right at the top 200 gigapascals. And you have to remember that gigapascals are 10 to the 9. I won't put in the units at this stage. And the area, we calculated that here. That's 4 times 10 to the minus 4. Plus Young's modulus of the... Sorry about this focus. That's a bit annoying. Better. Plus Young's modulus of the brass. 105 times 10 to the 9 multiplied by the area of the brass, which we've already agreed is 5 times 10 to the minus 4. And I can work out what all of that bit in brackets is on my calculator. So 200 times 10 to the 9 times 4 times 10 to the minus 4 plus 105 times 10 to the 9 times 5 times 10 to the minus 4. And that comes out to be 1, 3, 2, 5, followed by five zeros. That's 1, 3, 2.5 times 10 to the 6, whatever the units of that are. And I guess, in fact, they are Newtons. So then epsilon equals 60,000 divided by 132.5 times 10 to the 6, which equals 4.53 times 10 to the minus 4, and it's a strain, so that's just my answer for the strain. Um, but that's good. Now I know how much the whole column deforms by. Now I'm going to go back and uh, just take a look at the question again um, to check what I was asked. The, the, the question actually asked for the stress in the brass and the deformation of the assembly. So let's calculate both those things now in turn. Once you know this stress, it's pretty easy to calculate everything else because, for example, for the uh, stress in the brass, we can note that sigma b stress in the brass is Young's modulus in the brass times epsilon in the brass. 
which equals, and now we use the Young's modulus from the question, that's 105 gigapascals multiplied by the stress, the strain in the brass, which we've just calculated. 4.53 times 10 to the minus 4, which equals. Forty seven million five hundred sixty five thousand pascals, which I'm going to call forty seven point six megapascals. And that's my answer. So I'm going to make it super clear. That's my answer for part A. And for part B, we are asked for the uh, deformation of the assembly. We know the strain. We know the original length, so we can find the change in length. Um, if epsilon equals delta L over L, delta L equals epsilon L, and that's what we're going to use, the change in length. Delta L equals epsilon L, which equals 4.53 times 10 to the minus 4 multiplied by the original length, which is this 250 millimetres, uh, and that is 0 0.25 metres, we've already agreed. Which comes out as 1.1325, I'm going to call that 1.13 times 10 to the minus 4 metres. And again, that's my final answer for that. So I'm just going to make sure it's really clear that that's an answer. And that is question two, part one, um, the the complete thing solved. We've, we've gone through, we've count, uh, sort of drawn out the diagram and made use of the diagram and tried to kind of use that to get some understanding. Then we did things like calculating the areas, converting the units into meters. So that was an important step. Then we had this condition, and this is kind of the, the big understanding that we need, that the, the brass and the steel have to deform at the same um, amount. So the strain in the brass equals the strain in the steel. That's condition one, which is the compatibility condition. And condition two is about the force has to be supported the 60,000 kilonewtons has to come from a force in the brass and a force in the steel. Then we, from the data sheet, we had all the ways to convert between stress, force and strain. And so we used those to work through until we got to a calculated strain uh, at the end, which applies to both the brass and the steel. And then we could use that calculated strain fairly straightforwardly to calculate stresses and changes in length. So that's the, the structure of the question. Um, one thing that's really important uh, that I want to really reinforce for all of the questions on the paper in the resit, make sure you answer something for every part of every question on the paper. Make sure you draw a diagram for uh, every part of every question on the paper. And you know, here, I think realistically, even if this calculation goes a bit wrong, which sometimes it can do, you know, I know that, that sometimes I'll make mistakes in, in things like this. If I've been able to do everything down to this line, uh, which is, is an easier set of calculations and, and things that we understand, and then I can, have a go at doing this bit and get it reasonably close. I've got a great answer there. You know, um, don't assume it's not worth doing something um, because it seems too trivial. Make sure you just get everything down on the page. It's a really important exam kind of strategy because it's also really important as a way of thinking about any big problem that's difficult. Um, OK, that's good. I'm going to move on if it's OK to Question two, part two. Uh, shout or put sorry, something sorry. in. The... Yeah. So you know for the second part where you have to find the change in length. Yeah. 
Um, because the original length, 250, is written in millimeters, you have to write your final answer in millimeters as well. Do you have to keep it as meters? It's, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it would be better if I'd written it in millimeters as well. I don't think you'd lose any marks for having it in meters. I yeah, think okay. that that kind of thing, you know, particularly because meters are the the official SI yeah, unit. Yeah. I think you can always put something in meters and be safe. Again, that's why I quite like doing these conversions at the start, because I'm always pretty happy if I've got an answer in meters. Nobody's going to complain about that. But if my answer's in like. I don't know, micrometers and I don't label it correctly, I might lose some marks. So, mm, yeah, yeah okay, it's, cool. so either way, both are fine. Yeah, either way, it's fine, um, I think right. is the key thing to have. Thank you, thank you. Cool. OK, let's keep going. That's a really helpful question as well, by the way. And I guess it's another opportunity for me to. Um, uh, repeat another point that I know people have heard of from me before. Just always keep an eye on your units. Make sure your answers have the appropriate units next to them. That kind of thing is really important. Makes a, a again. In terms of like actual real life engineering, if you leave the units out, people won't know what your answer means. So that's why it's important in exams as well. Just make sure you've always, where appropriate, got units. And of course, I don't have units here because strain is dimensionless. It's a length divided by a length. OK, um, some of this will come up again in question two, I guess. So let's look at question uh, two, part two. That's this one here, uh, just kind of looking at it um, straight away, it's two cylindrical rods held between two fixed ends, and one part's made of steel, and it has a certain, um, as soon as I see this alpha, which is a thermal expansion coefficient, I know that there's going to be something about thermal expansion coming up, and then it's got, um, another part made of brass and the, again the information is given there it says the rod is initially unstressed and then there's a temperature rise of 50 degrees c what's the compressive force induced in abc okay good so the first thing i would do of course is to draw my diagram make sure i've got a kind of clear visual representation of what's going on Uh, this is 300 millimeters. And this is 250 millimeters. And this is 30 millimeters diameter. And it is uh, in the question, it tells me AB is steel. And then I can write down the information about steel in this case, which is Young's modulus is 200 gigapascals and alpha the thermal expansion coefficient is 11.7 times 10 to the minus 6 per degree c the units of expansion coefficients are either per degree c or per kelvin it's the same thing so 50 millimeters diameter here uh, is what's marked and this is brass and again, we've got uh, Young's modulus, which is 105 gigapascals and an expansion coefficient of 20.9 times 10 to the minus 6 per degree C. Um, again, what I might just do to start with, uh, just to, to get everything nice and clear in my head, is get the dimensions into meters. 300 millimeters is 0.3 meters. 250 millimeters is 0.25 meters. Uh, 30 millimeters is 0.03 meters. 50 millimeters is 0.05 meters. And then if I call this section here geometry, and I'm just thinking about kind of important things to do with geometry and areas and lengths and things like that, I can calculate some areas. 
So for the steel, the area equals, these are um, circular or cylindrical, so the cross section is a circle. So the area is pi r squared, and that equals pi times, remember this is a diameter, so it's going to be half the diameter, so 0 0.015 squared. Sorry, I made that a bit messy. Um, you could you could do it more tidily, I'm sure. Um, the key thing is I'm using half of this diameter, and that's 0 0.015. Um, again, never feel bad about using a calculator, by the way. If you know if it's easier to use your calculator um, to do these conversions or to go from diameter to radius, absolutely fine. You could even make a note, uh, diameter equals two times radius. And then that, you know, any anything you do like that will just help you uh, get the, the answers right, which is the key thing. So this area is 7.07 .07 times 10 to the minus four square meters. And I've, I've rounded that off a bit. It's 7.068 something, something. And for the brass, I can calculate the area. And that's pi times uh, half of 50 millimeters is 0 0.025 uh, meters. And I'll square that. And the answer comes out to be 1.96 times 10 to the minus three square meters. Now, I don't even really know how I'm going to use all this geometry um, at the moment, but I just suspect it's going to be useful. Again, areas are often useful because stress is force divided by area. Um, Lengths we'll, we might need to know because they come into the calculations about what strain means. So, uh, and they also um, might turn up in the um, thermal effects as well as the mechanical effects. So lots of reasons why it's just good to calculate geometry straight away in as many of these problems as you can. Uh, next. Um, Let's just think about free thermal expansion. So this is how we're going to work these questions. First of all, we think about if there wasn't any uh, constraint, if, if it was just the, the brass pipe and the steel pipe and nothing holding them in place and you heated them up, how much would they expand by? How much would they grow? Um, and then what you do is you say, OK, how much force do I need to push them back to where they were? And that's the total force that will be kind of inside um, the, the induced in the structure um, by this thermal expansion. So starting out just thinking about free thermal expansion, and as soon as I've written the words thermal expansion, I'm going to go to the data sheet and find this one here. Thermal strain is alpha times the temperature difference. I'm going to write epsilon T for epsilon thermal is alpha times delta T, the temperature difference. And in this case, that's so that that I've just written is the general rule. In our case, epsilon is going to be alpha for brass times the temperature difference. Hmm. Well, I guess epsilon for the brass, the strain in the brass is that, and the strain in the steel is alpha for steel times the temperature difference. So the total strain is both of those added together. Um, this is, OK, this is where you, I've, I've got to do some thinking, right? 
what's going to happen is the brass will expand some some amount and the um steel will expand some amount it's better for me to calculate or it, the correct thing to do in fact is to calculate how much it expands first and then add up those expansions so we might say the brass expands by a millimeter the steel expands by half a millimeter so the total expansion is one and a half millimeters that will work what won't work is what the route i was about to head down which is to kind of calculate some total strain because we've got different lengths of brass and steel so there's no easy way to convert a total strain into a change in length so uh, based on all of that i'm just going to calculate these numbers the strain in the brass is alpha b times delta t which is 20.9 times 10 to the minus 6 multiplied by 50 degrees and that's 1.045 times 10 to the minus 3 and it's a strain so it doesn't have any units the strain in the steel is uh alpha delta t is 11.7 times 10 to the minus 6 multiplied by the 50 degrees and that comes out to be 5.85 times 10 to the minus 4. again that um doesn't have any um units next we can say uh we can calculate the deformation of the brass and the strain the the total amount that they have um stretched in terms of a length delta l for the brass is going to be epsilon times the length of the brass which is 1.045 times 10 to the minus 3 multiplied by uh this 300 millimeters which we've agreed is 0 0.3 meters and that comes out to be No point. Hang on a minute. Three point one three five times ten to the minus four meters. So about a third of a millimeter. And delta L for the steel is also epsilon uh, L which is 5.85 times 10 to the minus 4 multiplied by 0 0.25 meters. And that is going to equal 1.4625 times 10 to the minus 4 meters. So the total delta L change in, sorry, my delta sometimes look like A's. I'm sorry about that. Uh, the total delta L change in length is this plus this. And that equals. 4.5975 times 10 to the minus 4 meters. Uh, good. Next, we've got that total change in length. Now we think about uh, the mechanical side of things. So that was free thermal expansion. The mechanical compression, uh, or the by mechanical, I just mean the the force applied by the constraints. Uh, and that must lead to um, 4.5975 times 10 to the minus 4 meters of um, compression. Somehow the overall length has to stay the same. 
So again, what I'll do now, because as soon as I'm thinking about these mechanical things, I'm going to go back to the data sheet and write out my stress and strain relationships from the data sheet. Sigma equals F over A, epsilon equals delta L over L, and sigma equals E epsilon. Now, what we're interested in, we know um, delta L um, total. We know how much of delta L we need. So I'm going to try and write delta L and relate it to force somehow, because what we want to know is what is the total force applied. So we can say, OK, delta L equals uh, length times strain. And we know strain is stress divided by Young's modulus. So this is length times stress, div stress divided by Young's modulus. And we know stress is force over area. So this is length times force times length times force over Young's modulus times area. So what we've been able to do there is work out uh, given delta L, um, what, what information we need to calculate delta L. The force acting on everything is the same. The length, the Young's modulus, and the area are different for brass. So if we want the total Young's modulus, it's the force uh, times the length for brass, Young's, sorry, total deformation, total change in length, force times length of the brass divided by Young's modulus of the brass and area of the brass. That's this formula applied just to the brass plus the force times the length of the steel divided by the Young's modulus for the steel and the area of the steel. So we get uh, part of the answer for um, the brass and part of the answer for the steel. And we can take out a factor of the force there, which is the thing we don't know. So rearranging that, the force equals the change in length that we want divided by all of the things in this bracket. And now this is slightly tricky calculator work. I'm going um, to work out the bracket first. So the length of the brass is uh, not point. Three divided by Young's modulus for brass, which is 105 times 10 to the 9, multiplied by the area of the brass, which we calculated, we knew we'd need it in the end, 1.96 times 10 to the minus 3. So that bit turns out to be 1.4. Six times ten to the minus nine. Uh, and this bit here, the length of the steel is 0 0.25. The Young's modulus is 200 times 10 to the nine. And the area is 1.96 times 10 to the minus three. No, uh, seven point, sorry, that's the wrong one. 7.07 .07 times 10 to the minus 4. So that's 1.768 times 10 to the minus 9. And we know delta L from the previous calculation is 4.5975 times 10 to the minus 4. And when I put that into my calculator, 4.5975 times 10 to the minus 4 divided by 
1.46 times 10 to the minus 9 plus 1.768 times 10 to the minus 9. I get 142425 point something. I'm going to call that 142.4 kilonewtons. This is a force, uh, and so our answer has to be in newtons, and I got 142,425. I'm calling that 142 kilonewtons. Um, and that's our final answer. At this stage, again, a kind of bit of exam strategy, go back to the actual question and look at it and make sure that you've answered what it wanted. Determine the compressive force induced in ABC when there is a temperature rise of 50 degrees C. We've done that. So um, I guess what's going on here? What's the big picture? Uh, first of all, as always, draw out the diagram. Um, and even if you feel like it's just repeating something that's on the question paper, it's a useful thing to do. Calculate any geometry that you can. You saw how at the end of the question, we suddenly ended up needing uh, those areas and it was useful that we just had them. We didn't have to go back and think about them. Then for these thermal expansion questions, uh, one typical strategy is you work out, first of all, if it was just completely free to expand, how much would this expand? You use the formula from the data sheet and then you calculate changes in length for each different material. That's what we did here. And we got a total change in length down here. Then we said, OK, it's not actually free to expand. It's fixed at the ends. So the, the force that's coming from the end fixings must be the same force that would give us this much change in length. And we used the stress strain relationships and the definition of stress, definition of strain, relationship between the two to work out, OK, how does change in length depend on force? That was the kind of key relationship we needed. Length, Young's modulus and area we already had. And finally, these two lines of the calculation are then translating that through. We know the change in length we want. We know all the lengths, Young's modulus and areas, so we can get this force that must be applied to everything. So that's how that question works. Um, I said we were going to go on to do question three as well, um, but I'm aware that we're out of time, really. That's five to two, and I don't want to hold up uh, people too much. EPD students, I know I've got a class at two o'clock. I just want to look very quickly at question three um, because I want to show you how to start it. Um, and it's got some torques measured, shown on it. The first thing that you would do is to draw a diagram, uh, obviously, and you could just repeat this diagram. Then what you need to do is remember that it's a torsion question. This is where I was saying, you know, check the the topic of the question and then see exactly directly from that what can i pull out from the data sheet and the data sheet has this section on torsion of shafts and we're going to need the torsion equation which is this one here so that's what i'd write down straight away and then also it said something about uh, power um, and so we're probably going to need this this equation here about power and the torsion equation depends on j uh, and so we're going to need one of these equations about J. So I would have all of those ready to go. And then what we need to do is work out the torque in each bit of the um, of the picture. And I just want to show you that and then we'll stop. Um, if I draw the picture side on, um, what we've got we sometimes draw torques like this uh, with a double headed arrow. I don't know if Naveed's been doing that, but um, it, it can be a useful thing to turn a three dimensional problem into something you can draw in two dimensions like I'm doing now. So we've got these two torques both pointing in the same direction. In this case, if I'm if I'm looking that way, they're both anti clockwise. That's what I mean by pointing in the same direction. 
And then what I can do is a kind of method of sections. If I uh, draw a section here, and I just think of what's happening to the left of it, I'll call that section one. I'm going to draw another one here and call that section two. And in both cases, we'll just look at what's happening to the left. There's 800 Newton meters of torque there. For equilibrium, there must be 800 Newton meters torque at the section. Right. In order for, for this bit of the, the structure to remain in equilibrium, it's got an external torque of 800 Newton meters applied. So there must be an internal torque of 800 Newton meters at any point that I section through there to balance things out. And similarly, if I look at section two, uh, there's a bit more going on, but the problem is the same. We've got 1600 Newton meters and we've got 800 Newton meters. Uh, and we've got a point here that has to be in equilibrium. So again, for equilibrium, there must be 1600 plus 800 Newton meters, i.e. 2400 Newton meters torque at the section. So now I know my internal torque in here, in the aluminium bit of the rod, and in here in the brass bit of the rod. And so I can go on now and solve the problem. And to solve the problem, I use the torsion formula T over J equals tau over R equals G theta over L. And my T is going to be 800 Newton meters for the aluminium section and 2400 Newton meters for the brass section. You can calculate J based on geometry. Again, do some calculations of uh, areas of circles. That's that's going to be needed straight away. I know a radius so I can get to a shear stress, for example. Or I know a length and I know uh, G so I can get to a twist angle. And that's how questions like that work. OK, that really is time. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I'm going to stick around just in case anyone has any questions. I think I'll stop sharing uh, so you can uh, see me again, I hope. like something's frozen a bit um yeah and good luck with the reset anyone wants help with the reset just let me know um, make sure you've got all of your coursework done as well if that's not complete um and um yeah i'll put my email address in the chat as well just for anyone who doesn't have that and have a good afternoon i'll stop recording now Okay, so you know how you're recording? Yeah. Where can we find this recording? It should